Uh, greetings, folks. Welcome to Thursday. Or if you're watching this later, welcome to the day whenever this is. Good greetings to everyone. Salutations. Happy day. Uh, we are still in the middle of a slightly chillier morning these days. Uh, we're in a spell of some chilly uh, overnights and early morning temperatures, but it does warm up during the day. Have you ever noticed the correlation between the evening sky and how cold it is in the mornings? Especially now in the winter, when we know the sun's actually, Earth is a little closer to the sun in the winter, right? Which we talked about. Um, you can see stars. Clear nights are the nights that are colder. And when the rain comes, which it did uh, with a vengeance over what, over that two week span uh, earlier. Oh, happy February. Gee, I haven't seen you since last month. That's okay, it's a little joke there. Um, the first few weeks of January, um, remember it was raining, cloudy, a lot of precipitation, a lot of humidity in the air, warmer. Yep. So there is something going on there. Cloud layer acts like a blanket. We'll talk more about that when we get into the heat section. i uh, just see if we can get that straightened up a little bit better. Okay. Um, all right, well, let's continue on where we were. And um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the sizes and distances that we were able, we, uh, uh, you'll find hopefully this interesting ancient Greek science. Um, I hate to say, uh, I don't know if they were scientists, but they were calculating stuff. Uh, we're going to have a talk about one of the uh, great calculations or a couple of the great calculations that were done by the ancient Greeks uh, about coming up on 20, uh, 2,500 years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, they calculated the circumference and therefore also the diameter of Earth, knowing that it was a globe. So we have known the size of Earth for about 2,500 years. Um, and uh, it turns out Earth is not flat. So yeah, 2,500 years we've known this. Um, let's, okay, let's see if we can go with black. Okay, uh, so we'll talk about that. Um, one of the things I mentioned before, <laughs> Well, maybe I didn't mention this, but I, I did just allude to it a little bit, which was that the ancient Greeks were really great at philosophizing, right? If you know anything about ancient Greek culture, and I don't really, but I do know a little bit about some of the more famous people, one of them being uh, Aristotle, who, you know, these, these people were, were people who looked into a lot of stuff. Um, we're going to talk about one particular one uh, today called Eratosthenes. Um, and he was really, really good at pretty much everything. Uh, he was a, uh, I would say, scientist. I put that in quotes because the ancient Greeks didn't really test their ideas. They, they, that's why I said they philosophized about them. They kind of thought about them, but they did mathematical calculations. For example, you're going to see one that I'm going to show you today that uh, Eratosthenes did to try and calculate how big, what, what size Earth is. Um, and boy, was he close. For 2,500 years ago, he was darn close. Um, he was also a uh, drama critic, uh, writer, uh, what else? Philosopher, mathematician. The list kind of goes on and on. He was really good at pretty much everything he turned his hand to. Um, but they did not really test their, their uh, ideas about why things were. So I mentioned Aristotle and, uh, and his idea of things being at rest um, as a natural state of things. 
heavier things falling faster. None of this was tested. And that's the real difference between a theory uh, that you come up with on one of these later nights, maybe a drink in your hand, feet on the, the, the couch, and you're saying, I got a theory about why this happened. And uh, there's a difference between that kind of theory and a science theory. And the science theories are ones that are tested and have passed these tests. And the, the way to, right, is the way to test whether or not your ideas are right, you know, go do the thing. How to, how to figure out whether your theories, your theories are correct, go test them. Um, so anyway, there's, there are differences in, 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 in science theories versus, um, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, there's, a, there's a term in football, the armchair quarterback maybe has a few theories about stuff like this. Well, there's a difference in those types of theories. Um, we have testing on our side, so that's good news. Um, anyway, so the ancient Greeks didn't really do a lot of testing of their ideas, but they did a lot of really great calculations, and I'm going to show you one right now, which is um, Eratosthenes' calculation of Earth size. So let's get into this. Um, first of all, how do we know that Earth was round? Why would you have started off, if you were Eratosthenes, what would have um, prompted you to say, well, can we figure out a diameter, right? Because you right away you're implying some type of circle, right? And the Greeks, boy, if they knew something about mathematics, it was circles and triangles. And you'll see that at full play today. Um, how do we know that Earth has curvature? Okay, how, do we, how, how did that come about? Well, there's a couple of different things that you could do back in uh, 2000, 2000, 2,500 years ago. Um, and one of them was to uh, make observations of the uh, horizon, right? The horizon is basically the line past which you can't see because Earth is dropping away from you, right? So um, if I make a, a, a drawing of someone standing here and they are on Earth, making sure here. So this is gonna have to be a pretty big Earth. I'm gonna have to make my person a lot smaller. Okay, there we go. Sure. All right, so they're standing here. Okay, there's a line. This is highly exaggerated. Uh, I hope that that goes without saying, but there's a line past which you basically can't see. And that line is because it's a tangent to Earth's uh, surface. So this person, if I were to estimate the horizon of this person, maybe about there. Trying to draw a tangent line, and I'm not sure that one came up too well, so let me darken that in. Oh yeah, that's better. All right, so this would be their, um, this would be their horizon. is the place where it just, the, the tangent line just touches the uh, surface of the globe, right? So if I held my globe up like this and you're standing here, well, you're not, you're standing about, where the heck are we? Uh, about there, right? So if you're standing there, you can imagine that you have some height, again, highly exaggerated because my pen is only this side, but you can imagine drawing a tangent line kind of like this, if I hold that up right on top of this, right, kind of like that. Maybe if I can make the per, if I make my pen smaller, I don't have anything smaller. Bad planning. All right, so look, if I do that, you can imagine a line drawn just like that, that just ticks the, uh, just ticks the globe. That horizon um, is your furthest point of seeing. And so a ship sailing on the oceans, this is one way they, they did this, a ship sailing on the ocean is completely not seeable to you um, standing there.
Okay, here's a ship sailing and it's past your vision. But think about as it moves this way, what's the first thing that you're gonna start to be able to see of the ship? It's gonna be the mast, right? You're gonna be able to see the mast first. You're just gonna tick the mast is gonna show up. And then eventually do, 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 the whole thing's gonna come into view. So one way they knew the earth was curved was because they, were, they could watch the masts of ships from a long distance and watch as the mast appeared and then the rest of the ship slowly appeared as it sailed up like that, right? It's kind of like coming up a hill and looking at someone who's standing on top of the hill. You, when you look down there, you see the head first, right? And then the rest of them comes into view as they start walking towards you. Um, so they had this idea that Earth was curved and Eratosthenes said, well, can we calculate how big it is? Now, Eratosthenes, <clears throat> um, Eratosthenes was a, uh, also a librarian and he took care of the great library at Alexandria. And Alexandria is kind of uh, on the north shore of, I'm gonna say on the north shore of Egypt or, oh no, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah north shore of Egypt. Uh, looking at the globe. I mean, no, I knew that, like I said, and I didn't need to check. Uh, it's on the north shore of, of Egypt um, on the uh, Mediterranean Sea there. And um, it turns out there's a pretty big river that runs in Egypt. And somewhere further down, further south, there is a uh, town which lie, or a, a settlement at that point, which lies just on or near the Tropic of Cancer. Okay. Last time in class, I mentioned that the places like the equator, the Tropic of Cancer, and the Tropic of Capricorn, which are uh, marked out important places. Why are they marked out important places? Because those two tropic lines are the last places, uh, they are as far away from the equator as you can get, and still have one day per year when the sun goes directly overhead. We don't get that because we're too far north up in the Northern Hemisphere. And I say we, I mean us here in uh, beautiful, sunny California, um, in case you are taking this class from some other locale in the world. So he, being the librarian in Alexandria and taking care of Alexander's library, which is a pretty big deal, he would be kind of upset if he did a bad job of it. Um, he came across a piece written by somebody from this town that's close to uh, the Tropic of, Ca Tropic of Cancer. The town's name at that point was Syene. It's now called Aswan. And the account of this person was, oh, there's this one day per year and it's called the summer solstice and the sun's directly overhead and shadows of, of columns disappear because the sun's directly overhead. So there's no, they cast no shadow. Um, wells, the sun shines directly down a deep well because it's directly, the sun's directly overhead and the well's dug straight down. So you can go into a well and, and see the sun as it passes right overhead. Um, this is a unique thing. We would never have seen anything like this unless you go further south towards those places. So. In Alexandria, right? So that's in the town of Syene. Now in the Alexandria, that didn't happen because they're too far north. They cast shadows on the longest day of the year. So here, let me draw you this diagram. Okay. So um, Eratosthenes, I'm gonna write his name down here for you. Okay. Eratosthenes calculated the size of Earth. And the way he did that was by saying, okay, um, if there's a place where Earth, um, where you can go on Earth and the sun doesn't cast a shadow, but over here, it does cast a shadow, there's only really one way you can uh, justify that. And that's once again, curved Earth. 
Okay, you can imagine that if um, if you had two sticks stuck in the ground at uh, Syene and, and, and at Alexandria, if they were on a flat plane, there would be no way that one of them casts no shadow and one of them casts a shadow. If these were on a flat plane, there's no way. They either both cast a shadow or they both cast no shadow. So if you think of Earth as being curved, then that tilts this one, right? And now sunrise, sun rays coming from the very top, say, okay? This one casts no shadow. This one's tilted. And so sunlight coming this way is going to cast a shadow on the ground right down here. And he used that fact uh, to calculate the size of Earth, right? Isn't that beautiful? It's just fantastic. Um, so let's see here. Suppose the sun is over on that side and it's um, shining light this way. I'm going to erase all this. Okay, so sunlight's coming in from this side. All right, uh, so I want to give you this idea. Sun is really big and it's really super far away. So the light basically comes in parallel to us, um, more or less. Now, um, Let's see here. If we have Earth, oh good, I can go way over here. Um, now, if we have Earth, say, something like that, okay? The center of this, I'm trying to make approximate circular arc. The center of this would be, say, right about here. Okay. Um, and this is Earth's surface up here. <clears throat> Here's your sunlight. All right, now if we're um, in Alexandria and we have a, a stick in the ground, it casts no shadow. Uh, sorry. Wrong one. If we're in Syene and we have a stick in the ground, it casts no shadow on this one day of the year, the summer solstice. So here is, uh, let's say Syene's probably about here. The town of Syene is about there. We'll just pretend Alexandria is, say, somewhere up here. So if I put a stick in the ground up here, if I put a stick in the ground up there, it's going to cast a shadow. Okay. So imagine taking the light from, from, the, from the sun here, it's going to come in. It's going to make a shadow because all of these ones down here are going to get blocked. Right? So they are not going to reach Earth. The shadow is going to be about like that. Right? That'll be the shadow. Now, that's important because it gives us some information. Now, this is where mathematics and Greek knowledge of circles and triangles really came in. Watch what we can draw here, okay? If Earth is curved and it's a circular, it's like circular in cross-section, like I'm drawing here, okay? Then I can make a triangle between these three points, center of Earth, Syene here, and Alexandria here. I can make a triangle between these three points. Check this out, right? So here's Syene. Here's Syene. I actually want to make my center maybe a little bit lower. Okay. So here, oops. Okay. 
right? And my center is about here somewhere. And now here's a triangle. Now I, I understand this is gonna be kind of curved, but let's assume for a little while that it's not so curved that it's not pretty much straight. Oops, not like that. On this diagram, that's gonna be very exaggerated, um, but you already know in real life, if you walk from uh, say here to uh, I don't know, where can we walk to from here? If you walk from here to say someplace several miles away, it's basically gonna be, it's, you're basically gonna feel like you're walking straight. You're not gonna feel like you're walking on the curve. Um, now check this out. Um, if we look at this triangle here, There is a, uh, there's a correlation between the angle that's made between the sunlight and the stick. Okay. Okay, that angle in there, there's a correlation between that angle there and this angle here. It's the same angle. So whatever angle the shadow makes from the sunlight up here is the same angle that we could say exists in this triangle that we're imagining from a stick perpendicular to the ground, it would go straight towards the center of Earth, stick perpendicular to the ground, the line goes straight towards the center of Earth, and here's our triangle. The angle now, if I can measure this angle up here from the shadow, which I can do, right? I, can, I just gotta take a thread with a weight on it and see how far, okay, where does the shadow go? How far is that angle? I, I, that's a calculation that they could definitely do. That's the same angle right down there. Right? That's a little bit of geometry for you, <clears throat> which the Greeks were great at. So um, Eratosthenes said, okay, well, if I measure this angle, well, you measure this angle and you say it's this angle. And I knew this distance from Syene to Alexandria, then I could make a, I could make a relationship because this is a pie slice of a, of a circle, right? So if I know the angle and I know how much distance this is, well, I know the full angle in a circle is 360 degrees. Well, what would be the full distance that goes with the 360 degrees? And he could figure that out, right? So he could say, he could take this angle to this distance and say that's the same as 360 degrees to the full circumference of the earth. And he could figure out that circumference of earth just by measuring this distance and this angle. That's pretty good. You got to admit, that's some nice reasoning right there. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> oh, you know what I can, you know what I can do? I can go like this. Let's see here. How far over? Whoa. <laughs> All right, how about if I go a little bit like that? Okay. Now you can see it's gonna be a little further away. So he says, uh, this angle, the angle that he measures, okay. All right, that's my denominator here, right? 
So the angle divided by the Syene to Alexandria distance. Are we getting that? How about if I slide over just a little more? Can I go a little further that way? Whoop, here, I'm gonna, easy. Okay, how about that? All right, so if I take this, this fraction, I'm gonna say that's equal to the entire way around the earth angularly divided by the entire way around earth on Earth's surface, right? So I can say now that that is equal to three hundred sixty degrees Oops, I'm going to stop right there. Circumference. <laughs> okay. So he can calculate the circumference of Earth by measuring that angle, which he can do with a, with a plumb bomb, and then measuring the distance from Syene to Alexandria, which he did. He paid some guy to go walk it and measure off the, the steps. This is how you earn money back in ancient Greece. If you uh, had nothing better to do for like a year, maybe, maybe six months. I don't know. I don't know how long this would take. This would take a long time. The distance is 500 miles and you've got to pace it off and tell you, that you got to go tell your boss. Uh, all right, I counted my number of steps and each step was about this. Yeah, that's one of my normal steps. So this was a bit of an average procedure. You can imagine there would be a great deal of uncertainty involved in this. Nevertheless, this distance they calculated, or I'm uh, sorry, they measured, it was about 500 miles. And the angle was about seven-ish, a little more than seven degrees. So this ratio fraction here turned out to be one divided by 50, if you reduce it all down and make it nice. Um, Uh, about like that. So this is about one divided by about 50. That gives you a circumference of about 25,000 miles. All right. And that's pretty much right to within a few percent. I'm going to move you back over here now to there. All right. So that's pretty much correct to within, uh, I think, three or three or five percent. It was just astounding the accuracy that we know we know this number now and we can compare it to somebody who calculated it 2500 years ago <clears throat> right so i will say this distance here was 500 miles and so this angle is about 7 degrees so seven and five, oh, I, I totally messed that up, didn't I? That's not one in 50. That's way off. Never mind. The one in 50 is that this is only about one fiftieth of the way around Earth, right? Because seven, it was a little more than seven. If I multiply seven by five, it's 35. So seven times 50 is 350. And it wasn't quite seven, it was a little more. So it works out about 360. So this distance is one fiftieth of the distance around Earth because this is the one fiftieth of the angle to go around Earth. That's what I that that fraction is not one fiftieth. That's okay. We can't see it anymore. Um, so this is about one fiftieth of the, the distance around Earth, according to uh, Eratosthenes. And boy, he was pretty much right. All right, got the full word in this time, I think. Yeah, it looks like it. All right, so that's 1 50th of the circumference. And so he says 50 times 500, that's about 25,000 miles. Of course, they weren't using miles back then. Uh, they were using some other units. But if we translate what we know about what the ancient Greeks knew about their measurements to ours, 
it works out this way. And lo and behold, yeah, that was, that was about right. So we've known that Earth is round and we've known it's about 25,000 miles around for 2,500 years. Um, and that gives Earth a radius of somewhere around 4,000, a little less than 4,000 miles uh, in radius, right? That would be that distance right there. Okay, that would be the radius of Earth, and it's around 4,000 ish miles. Um, all right, so this is how Eratosthenes calculated the size of Earth. Amazing, right? Just one little odd piece of knowledge that uh, sticks cast no shadow at this place on Earth on this day, and sticks do cast a shadow where I am, and I can figure out about how much of a shadow that is, and now all of a sudden I know how big Earth is. Fantastic. I mean, that is tremendous. I, 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 I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Tremendous. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause here. Uh, for those of you who are here, thanks for showing up this morning. Any questions that I could answer for you at this point? We have one, maybe it's too detailed, but like, how did they know that uh, the angle of a circle was 360 degrees? Like that sounds sort of arbitrary. Well, in the measurement of degrees, uh, because a, a degree has a particular size, the measurement of the circle all the way around is 360 degrees. Um, they didn't, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't quite, uh, I, I cheated a little bit with that. They have, um, you know, it's ancient Greece, so they know circles and diameters and uh, circumferences. And so they actually used a different unit of measure. Did they use the radian? They used the radian. Because they know, yeah, because they know uh, the circumference is uh, pi times the diameter. So they used a, a unit of measure that was based on pi. Um, I was translating it into angles to make it a little, hopefully a little more palatable. But um, no, you're right. The, the, the degree thing wasn't something that they did. OK, thanks. Yeah, good point. Other questions? All right, so now that we know how big Earth is, how big is the moon? How could we figure that out if we're, we're back here 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece and we go, uh, hey, uh, I see that thing up there. It tells us about how long a month is when it goes from phase repeats all the way back to the original phase. We talked about phases of uh, planets last time, phases of the moon, same type of thing, right? It's, um, quarters, um, no, um, half full, half new, half full, half new. Oh, that's a great way to remember it. <laughs> nice, half full, half new. Um, anyway, so, and then we talked about uh, solar eclipses and we talked about lunar eclipses, okay? Now, let's look at a, the, um, Let's look at the both those eclipses, okay? And let's see if they can give us anything useful. This was done by a fellow by the name of Aristarchus. All right, so this was done by Aristarchus and this is his calculation of how big moon is and is gonna soon be followed up by, uh, it wasn't his calculation about how far away moon is, but they used his data, and then he tried to figure out how far sun was, how far away sun is. So let's do that. Um, so Aristarchus calculated the, the size of the moon um, by doing the following. Uh, let's see here. Let's take a look at a uh, solar eclipse first. Okay. So once again, sun over here sunlight coming in uh, this way, and moon is here. Uh, yeah, let's put moon right about here. Big M for moon. 
Earth is over here. That is terrible. Nonetheless, it's okay for our purposes. Now, a solar eclipse is a situation where from our perspective here on, here on Earth, we're looking this way and moon is blocking out sun, like almost completely, okay? So the, the sunlight's coming in, sun is so big that uh, it causes the moon's shadow to taper a little bit, okay? Now I told you in the last uh, bit with the circumference of Earth that sunlight was coming in parallel. That's not completely 100% true because, because um, the sun has a huge size compared to Earth, okay? Um, so sunlight could be coming in, there's, there's, there's brightness up there. What tells the brightness that it has to only go this way? Well, it could go anyway. Sun emits everything in all directions, right? It's just like a big, uh, I, I don't know, it just emits garbage all over the place, right? Everything, it just spews out stuff in all directions, okay? And it spews out a lot of stuff. So what happens is the moon casts a shadow, but the shadow isn't like this the entire way. Right? In other words, the moon's shadow right? If there was no tapering of the shadow, then the moon's shadow would cast would be as big as the moon on Earth, which would mean that it would eat up a pretty sizable if we were looking at a solar eclipse, a lot of people would be able to see it at the same time because I mean if the moon's shadow, that would be like the moon's right on top of us can't see past it, so it casts that big of a shadow. But that's not what happens. What happens is the moon's shadow tapers. And this is key. The shadow actually tapers a little bit. And you will, you will probably are familiar with this because um, if you look at, let's see here. Uh, this is going to be a little wonky because that's really bright for this. But if you look at the shadow, if I hold this out here and I put that there. So here's my uh, pen and my hand with my shadow, right? Now, if I think about a really large sun, say the sun was up here, partly shining down. See the difference in the top of the pen? The shadow has moved downwards compared to where my top of my pen is. And if the sun was here, look at the bottom of the pen. Bottom of the pen would have moved upward slightly. So if you combine those two things together, well, the problem is my lamp is not the size of the sun. Uh, we're looking into some buns for the sun-sized lamp. Gosh, that would be great, wouldn't it? So when you think about the sunlight coming in from a large sun, the sunlight actually comes in and uh, hits the moon and causes the moon shadow to taper. And what Aristarchus did was he assumed um, almost correctly that the moon's shadow actually tapers down almost the full diameter of the moon. It tapers down to almost nothing. So instead of the moon's shadow being this, I'm going to now erase that. The moon's shadow actually looks like this, and it's kind of an ice cream cone looking type of thing, okay? <clears throat> right, and so it turns out that you can say, eh, it's close enough to nothing as to say that it's approximately, its diameter has, I mean, the shadow has tapered by almost the exact size of the moon because it's now down to a, a small point. And if you look at um, maps of the eclipse, you'll see there's only, it's like a, it's like maybe a 50 mile band across earth that that's the totality zone or something like that, right? It's pretty small. Compared to moon, that's a small amount. So we can assume that it's essentially zero, all right? So Aristarchus says, okay, during a solar eclipse, the shadow tapers by approximately one moon diameter. 
take that information and now go over to the lunar eclipse. The lunar eclipse is the one where the moon is in the shadow of Earth. So that would put the moon over on this side. Maybe give myself a little more room right there. Okay, so now let's look at the lunar eclipse. I'm gonna draw the moon over here. So let's suppose moon's over there. I'm move a little more, make it a little see, or maybe see it a little better. Okay. Now, uh, sunlight still coming in from this side over here. Okay. And now Aristarchus makes a uh, an interesting assumption, and he says, "Okay, look, moon and sun are. I'm sorry, uh, moon and Earth are not the same size, and they're also, but they're close enough in size compared to the sun. Sun's huge, and it's probably far away." And he's going to try and figure out how far away in a little while. He says, these are about the same size. Let's assume that Earth's shadow, right? When, if I draw the same type of thing as, 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 uh, as I did for the moon, Earth's getting bathed in sunlight, but its shadow is tapering. Let's assume that its shadow tapers by one moon diameter, just like the moon did. Okay? So let's assume that the shadow from Earth get, gets cast, comes down, and... Mm -hmm. Oh, probably a little too much there. Uh, let's assume that Earth's shadow also tapers by one moon diameter. So here, out here at the distance of the moon, Earth's shadow is smaller than Earth by one moon diameter. Because when we did it over here with the solar eclipse, moon's shadow by the time it got to Earth was smaller than the moon by one moon diameter because it was basically nothing. So let's assume Earth's shadow by the time you get to the moon is shorter by one moon diameter. So what he did was he says, OK, watch the, sol the lunar eclipse. Sun, um, gosh, moon goes into Earth's shadow, okay? It's this big, okay? Chart how many moons across it goes, how many sizes of the moon do I see in the shadow before it comes back out again? And he counted there were about two and a half moon diameters. Okay, in other words, moon goes in, is fully inside the shadow of Earth here. I go, okay, I'm gonna mark that point in the sky. I'm gonna watch the moon go across a little more and it's still in the shadow. Okay, mark that point, that's two moon diameters. It's gonna go out, oh look, it's starting to come out. It's starting to come out, it's about halfway out. Okay, so one extra half moon diameter. And he says that's how big Earth's shadow is at the distance of the moon here. Remember the Earth's shadow tapered by one moon diameter. So we're going to add that back in, right? Because this is not the size of Earth. This is the size of Earth minus one moon diameter out here. Shadow size is that. So we're going to add that one moon diameter back in. We're going to say this is three and a half moon diameters. And therefore, Earth diameter is three and a half moon diameters. So we're going to add back one moon diameter for the shadow taper. And now we're going to say, that Earth's diameter is three and a half moon diameters. And now all we got to do is go, 
Excuse me just one second. Let me dial up my friend Eratosthenes. Uh, do you happen to know how big Earth is? Oh, yeah. Oh, we know the circumference? I know how to calculate the diameter from the circumference. Thanks a bunch. And now, since we know how big Earth's diameter is, we now know how big Moon's diameter is. Just three and a half, uh, it's Earth divided by three and a half. So Earth's diameter is about three and a half times bigger than Moon's diameter. And lo and behold, that's pretty close too. Uh, it's actually about 3.7 instead of 3.5. Eh, potato, potato, pretty good for 2,500 years ago, huh? <clears throat> yep, yep, okay. All right, so. We know Earth's circumference. Right? Now, therefore, we know Earth's diameter. If we know Earth's diameter, now we know Moon's diameter. See how the dominoes are falling here? Questions about this that I could answer for you. Boy, isn't that some great reasoning? I totally dig that. All right. So we've got Earth's circumference from Eratosthenes calculation. We've got Earth's diameter, which follows just by dividing the circumference by pi. We now divide that diameter by three and a half. And now we know how big Moon is. Well, now how far away is Moon? You too can make this calculation. Well, I mean, you could have made all these calculations, but this one's uh, pretty good because Earth, I mean, uh, Moon is coming up on full. So next time we get uh, the full Moon disk in the sky, go get, go get a coin, you know, maybe a, a penny or a dime or, or something like that. Order depends on how far away you want to hold it. But try to match, right? Look at, look at the Moon in the sky and say, okay, I see that. Can I make this coin cover, just like moon covers sun, can I make that eclipse the moon? Can I hold it in such a way that I can't see, right? If it's, oh, oh no, that's too far away, right there, right? If it's any closer, then it's way too big, right? I wanna just cover it. So I take my coin and I say, okay, I'm holding it that far away from my eye. And that's the same angular size in my vision that the moon is. Okay, now, well, the Greeks thought of that and they said, well, I could make a triangle out of that too. Boy, they were so good with triangles. Check this out. <clears throat> okay, you're holding a coin some distance away from your face and you can measure that distance and your diameter of your coin you can measure that too. So I know how big the coin is that way. And I know how far it is away from my eye this way. You see where I'm going here? That's gotta be the same ratio as the moon takes up in our vision. And therefore, since we now know how big the moon is, now we can find out how far away it is. Eh? That's pretty good. <laughs> so here's your eyeball. Okay, and you're holding the coin in front of it. Or something, I don't know, your thumb, right? You can do that too. Um, and the amount of, of angle in your vision that the coin takes up would be Oh, right. Okay, about like that. And if I take that triangle and I extend it outwards, hmm. 
not sure how far I can go here. I can go a little further. Okay, let's go a little further. Whoa, like that. I don't know, like that. Somewhere out here is the moon. Okay, I'm gonna draw it in right about here. There's your moon. The diameter of the coin to the distance away the coin is from your face should equal the diameter of the moon divided by how far away the moon is from your face. Right, simple right triangle geometry. Um, just great, really great stuff. So we would write something like coin diameter divided by coin distance should equal moon diameter and moon distance. Now, isn't that great? We can measure that one and that one, right? I can take and measure and say how big those things are, get my ruler out. We already know that one because um, Aristarchus just measured it for us. It's three and a half times, I mean, uh, three and a half times less than Earth's diameter. So we know how big that is. By the way, Earth's, like I told you, Earth's radius is about what did I say? It's about 4,000 miles. It's a little less than 4,000 miles. Well, uh, three and a half times less than that. Well, that means the diameter is about 8,000, say 70. So the moon's diameter is roughly a little more than 1,000. No, 2,000 miles. Ro moon's diameter should be roughly 2,200 miles or so like that. Earth's diameter is a touch less than 8,000 miles and about three and a half times less than that. It's close to four times less than that. So it's about, well, it's a touch over 2000 miles in diameter, okay? Now that we know moon's diameter, now we can calculate moon's distance. Isn't that great? Of course it is. <laughs> uh, so the moon's distance is roughly a quarter of a million miles, right? It's, it's about that. You may know this. Um, you may know this uh, from things like car commercials sometimes. Oh yeah, you, you were, you're past 300,000 miles. It's like you drove to the moon. Yeah, well, that's how much we drive. Astounding. Um, it takes light a proc just a touch over one second to get there and, and then one second to get back. Um, all right, so now we know how far away the moon is, 250,000 miles. The Greeks were like, what? It's a quarter of a million miles. There's no way. It's just right there. Isn't it? I could just, it's, can I just, I can reach out and just grab, no, I can't reach out and grab it. It doesn't seem that far away. And maybe for us, that's not that big of a deal because we grow up with these numbers, right? We grow up with Earth being 25,000 miles in circumference. And the moon is 10 times further away than the Earth's circumference, approximately, right? 250,000 miles. So the Greeks said, okay, how far away is the sun? Because if you notice closely, there's a thing called a solar eclipse. And this thing happens with the solar eclipse, right? All I got to do is take the moon, stick it where the coin is, and now put the sun where the moon is, and the same thing happens. Problem. We can't do this because moon diameter and moon distance, totally got those numbers now. Sun diameter, don't know. Sun distance, don't know. There's this thing in math, like if you have two things you don't know in an equation, you can't do anything. So this is a dead end. This reasoning is a dead end for the sun, unless we know how big the sun is or how far away the sun is, then we could get the other one. But for now, we have nowhere to go. So we got to do something else to try and figure out how far away the sun is. And then we could use this to find out how big the sun is. Um, so here's what they did to try and figure out. This is again, Aristarchus, and he's trying to figure out how far away the sun is. Uh, I will erase the board, pause for questions. What do you got?
Nothing? Not even one? Okay. It is an interesting experience uh, to be talking to an empty classroom, but it's not empty. You're here. That warms my heart. Thank you for being here. Uh, why would it take over one second for light to get from the moon to here? Uh, the light speed. Isn't it like 299, like thousand meters per second? It's... 299,000 kilometers per second. Yeah, okay, wait, it's 299 million meters. Okay, but a meter is only about a yard, right? Yeah, so if you translate okay. that into miles, you're gonna look at about 200,000, a little, a touch less than 200,000. Oh, I see. And so light's going about 200,000 miles per second. And so it's going to take just a niche over one second to get there and niche over one second to get back. And bear in mind now that how long does it take light to get from the sun to us? Isn't it like eight minutes? Yeah. <laughs> Sun's a long way away. Greeks didn't know this. Yeah, we know it, huh? That's awesome. All right, let's just, that's just our information. Though. Don't tell anybody. Cool. Good question. Thanks. <clears throat> um, all right, let's do um, Aristarchus's calculation of the sun distance. Now, I'll preface this by saying um, he was way off. His method was 100% perfect. Would have worked, no question. But it was in the accuracy of his measuring devices. And it turns out that there is a high, what's called a non-linearity in, in the inaccuracy here. So a small error, eh, a small, like a small discrepancy between um, a reading and, uh, well, or say, say between his measurement and our measurement, a small discrepancy makes a huge difference. In other words, if we, he measured, I'll, I'll show you this, but he measured it and he was really close with measuring the angle. But unfortunately, because of the nature of how the, how the sides of the triangles are related and functions and stuff like that, which I'm not really going to go into a whole bunch, but it may, it's magnified. The, the, the small um, miss, I don't want to say it's a miss measurement because it was correct for his time. It was just crude. And now, nowadays, once we get better equipment, you can totally make this measurement really fine. Um, and that makes a big difference in the answer. So let me show you what he did. Um, remember last time? Uh, where am I drawing? How about the sun's over here? Remember last time we were talking about the half moon? Where is uh, the sun and the moon in relation to Earth? No. Where's Earth in relation to the sun and moon if moon is at its half as observed by us? It's tangent. So like a 90 degree angle. Yeah, right, right, right. So to check this out, uh, can you see I'm going to do that? All right, so I'm going to put the moon right here. And I'm going to put Earth down here. Um, this is by no means at all to scale. <laughs> okay. This is, I'm just laughing looking at this. Okay. Um, to think that the sun is like over that side towards the moon. This is absolutely ridiculous. The sun is huge. Okay. It's enormous. And it's way over there. By bringing it in so that I can draw it for you. Um, it totally skews the perspective, okay? Okay, so here's the deal, quick recap. What do we know? We now know this distance right here. Uh, I'm just gonna put a check mark. We know that distance. That's the moon earth distance and we just found that, okay? Or, well, I mean, we kind of did, didn't we? <laughs> Pretty cool. Something is, is a great discovery 
if you make it yourself. Even if someone else has done it, that doesn't matter. If you do it, it's still a new discovery for you. Bear that in mind. It's an awesome experience. So check it out. We've got the moon earth distance. We want to know the earth sun distance. Now, remember, these are right angles. So I got a right triangle here. Greeks and right triangles, score. Okay, check it out, right? Here we go. There's a right angle right there. Um, I need two things about a right triangle and then I know everything about a right triangle, right? That's, that's math. I've only got one side though. I need something else. Now there's no way I'm gonna get the moon sun distance. I don't even know earth. Oops, I'm going this way. Earth sun distance, right? I don't know any of these other sides. We have to look at the angles. So Aristarchus said, okay, I'm gonna measure this angle right here. I'm gonna measure that angle. So he did, he goes, he goes to the sun and he goes to the moon and he goes, okay, are you 90 degrees apart? Well, they're not quite 90 degrees apart. He measured this angle and he got 87 degrees. Okay, I don't care if you know this number or not. Um, I don't really, well, do I care if you know any of these numbers? Not really, I'm, I'm not testing you on memorizing numbers. Um, check this out, that's wrong. Uh, I, gosh. So it pains me to say it's wrong. It's not the right measurement. Um, he did the best he could. The actual accepted value is 89.7 degrees. Okay, only 2.7 degrees from what he measured. Okay, when you do this, he says, okay, I'm gonna measure this angle. Now I can calculate this side of the triangle and he does it and I'm not gonna really bother too much about showing you how he does that. But his result was that the Earth sun distance is about 20 times the Earth moon distance. Okay, so he came out with a number here that was 20x of uh, moon Earth distance. Uh, distance. moon earth distance. All right, so that was his, that was the result of his calculation. Um, let's see, 250,000 miles, that would put you at about 5 million miles, right? Multiply that by 20, uh, 500,000, one extra zero, 5 million. 5 million miles. People freaked out at this. Right, it made the headlines. <laughs> it was all over uh, social media. That's a long way. So what did this do? It expanded their view. This stuff is far away. The sun, it's like, it just goes, right? It doesn't go that way, actually. For me, it goes this way. So it's just right there. How is the sun 5 million miles away? This thing must be huge. Remember the moon distance, moon diameter thing we just did? I mean, if the earth, if the sun earth distance is 5 million miles, imagine how huge the sun is. Well, it's gotta be 20 times bigger than the moon, right? And that's already, you know, that's gonna make it like eight to six, eight times bigger than earth. That's huge. They, they just, Right. That, that means we are not living in a place where stuff is just kind of whipping around us right here. This place is big. And furthermore, uh, he was off by a factor of 20. So the actual answer is about 100 million miles, not 5 million. Um, they wouldn't have known that until, uh, gosh, about almost 2000 years later, uh, Haley measured the diameter of the sun. Well, he didn't. He thought about how to do it, realized he was not going to be alive when the method was going to be implemented. So he had to write it down so that somebody could do it because he knew he was going to die soon. How about that for a story? Ah, Haley, the same guy who's Haley's Comet named after. Yeah, he measured the size of the sun 
Um, and that's when they realize the sun is freaking huge and it's way the hell out there, 100 million miles away. Are you kidding me? That's nuts. All right. So anyway, that uh, suddenly all Greeks are going like, okay, so we're a small thing in a big place. That's what that did for them. Um, all right, questions on uh, anything here that we have talked about so far? I think I got one more thing to go through and I think we're gonna be, yeah, just about right. Um, questions that you wanna answer? Uh, yeah, <laughs> good one. Hey, any questions that you want to answer? For me, that would be great. Why are we here? What are we doing? I'm going to start erasing this. Hopefully, you got it. If not, isn't the isn't the angle of the sun different at like every hour of the day? So, um, the measurement be different every single time. Well, if the moon's at half, though. Oh, so the moon has to be at half. It has to be at half because that's how you know you get the right angle right here. Yeah, but I mean, like, if the moon's at half, but it's like compare like seven a.m. to like like four p.m., the sun is like at different angles. So, but not relative to the moon. Oh, okay. Right, because if the moon is still at half what you're going to lose is you're going to lose sight of one of them. They both can be in the sky at the same time if the moon is at half. By the time the moon gets to its zenith, though, you're going to have just about lost the sun. The sun's going to be setting, right? Okay. Likewise, when the moon's just coming up and you can just barely go, oh, hey, the moon's at half, the sun's already going to be, it's going to be past noon. Oh, okay. right? So you're looking at an angle like almost 90 degrees between sun and moon and you're just kind of watching it go through the sky like that. And then moon comes up, sun sets, but while they're both in the sky, you can do this measurement and it'll work. I see. Yeah. Great question. <clears throat> All right. Um, and one last story to relate to you, and that is the, it kind of goes back to the first thing we started off with about uh, size of Earth, Eratosthenes. Um, you may have never heard of Eratosthenes before today, um, but you probably have heard of Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus was a uh, fellow who wanted to get out and see the world. No, I don't, I, I highly doubt that. Actually, I have no idea, maybe he did. That's why he became a sailor. Um, anyway, he made a journey to, um, from Portugal, which was, uh, which at that time, you know, Europe really, there was a spice trade, right? <clears throat> this is what, 1500s, close 1400s, 1492. 1400s. So um, Columbus is pretty sure that he can make a journey not to discover a new world, to find out if there's a quicker way to get to India. That's what he wanted. Why? Globe. Uh, Portugal, right there. <sighs> okay, here we are. Wait, I Here's thought he was going to the East Indies. To the East Indies, yeah. So that's like not, the Philippines and stuff. Not not West Indies. He wants to go to in East Indies. Like so, Indies, yeah. Huh? What? What? So to India, India, Philippines. Okay, so yeah, a little off. A yeah. Little bit. Like... Point is here. In order to make that journey, what do you got to do? Go around Africa. You got to go around Africa. That's not the easiest journey in the world. Um, there's a lot of problems with sailing around down here, um, especially in them wooden boats. The, even, even nowadays, we have problems with it. Um, the uh, seas are very choppy and unforgiving. So Columbus was thinking, can I get there quicker and less, less distress if I just go, uh wait did i miss it nope here we are yep if i just do that can i just can i just go from here 
right there, all the way over to here. Can I just do that? That's that's probably easy, right? Probably way easier than going around Africa. Africa's so big. Why don't I just sail around the rest of the world? So I <laughs> so to do this, he needed to he needed money to buy boats and build boats. And to do that, the only people who had that kind of money was the uh, basically the monarchy that at that point the king, uh, the king and queen of not Spain but Portugal, um, or kind of one and the other. So, anyways, point being here, um, they said, okay, fine, write us a proposal and tell us how you're going to do this. So he he writes the proposal up and he goes, well, look. Um, he makes this really interesting calculation. He goes, okay, suppose that 90% of the people on earth are living in Europe right now. That must mean that earth is way smaller. That's basically was his argument. Um, because he said that, you know, he was doing a population to land mass ratio. And he was just, asked, he was just saying, ah, well, 90% of the people live in, in Europe and that's, you know, one half of the land mass then the earth is only blah, 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 blah. And so he says earth is actually way smaller. He came up with something around, um, the circumference of around 15,000 miles or maybe 18,000 or something way smaller. And he submitted it and the king's science advisors, you know, what king probably doesn't know a thing. He said, hey, you, you people look at it. So the science, he has science advisors. They look at it and they go, you're out of your mind. Get out of here. We're not giving you money for this. You are going to die trying to do that because earth is not that size. Earth is this size. And if you try to sail all the way around that way, there's no way you're going to make it. You're going to be an ocean for three fourths of the way around the globe, and you cannot make that journey. So they said no. Columbus was a persistent fellow, went to the queen and said, Is there anything I could do? And it turned out, I guess there was, because uh, she said yes and gave him the money. And lo and behold, in trying to sail three quarters of the way around Earth, he ran into uh, the continent that is on the other, that is across the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it's astounding when you think about it. They they even made it that far. But anyways, um, that was right. Like I said, about fifteen hundred people had known for a thousand years. Uh, no, for 2,000 years by then, the Earth was round and was about 25,000 miles around. So when Columbus said, hey, I'm just going to sail three quarters of the way around in order to get to the, they said, no, there's no way. There's no way. We know this because it's been calculated and we can, right? We knew this. Earth's not flat. It's round. I don't know what's going on these days, but uh, Earth is still round. And it's still pretty much the same size as it was 2,500 years ago. But apparently people have forgotten this. Or some people have. Anyway. Um, so a little story about that. Um, I have an article linked in the Canvas page. I have a couple of uh, videos on um, Eratosthenes. And it's explained by Carl Sagan. The, uh, the story of Eratosthenes calculation is explained by Carl Sagan. That video is going to be linked or is already linked in the Canvas page. If you do not know who Carl Sagan is, please look and uh, the guy was a great, all right? Um, if you have heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson, he is trying to do now what Carl Sagan did already. And even Bill Nye, Bill Nye got advised by Carl Sagan uh, they, when he was at Cornell. So, uh, Carl Sagan was one of the first uh, people to bring popular, to bring science to uh, popular media um, and the popular media being TV. Um, he has a great series called Cosmos, highly, highly recommend that. Um, so there's a video on that. And then there's also a link to an article on the Columbus story that was also already in the Canvas page. I think I put a Wikipedia link to it, check it out. Um, that's all I think that I have time for today, I'm looking at, yep, looks like we're just about done here. Uh, so if there are any last questions, go ahead and sing out. Otherwise, I will say happy weekend.
and check into the homework. Should be pretty good to go on all questions. I think there's only nine, 10, 11, something around there. Um, make good diagrams, write out your, write out your uh, answers, submit on Canvas. Remember that next Tuesday it's due and the quiz is gonna be active all of next Tuesday. Um, and we can go through that again when I see you on Tuesday next, but uh, until then, enjoy your weekend. If you have any questions or problems, fire me an email. Thanks a lot for your attention, folks. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.